Good morning. How's everyone doing? You doing good? Well, I got a little cold. My little princess, she kissed me and said, Daddy, I got a cold. And uh, it's pretty neat. So I got the love for my little girl. So if I have that deep voice, that's why. I'm not trying to be sexy. But uh, if you're a Bible, please turn with me to Daniel chapter 1, verse 5. Daniel chapter 1, verse 5. And the title of today's message is Babylon is trying to defile our kids. And how many know Babylon? You know, Egypt's a picture of the world, but Babylon could be a picture of the world too, right? And uh, how many know the world is trying to sell your kids an agenda? How many, how many know that? I was listening to Fox News, and uh, I was listening to Geraldo and, uh, it was Geraldo and uh, Bill O'Reilly, and I forget who the other guy is from The Five, but he was kind of a liberal or a conservative, and uh, Geraldo's a liberal kind of. But he was saying how the biggest concern, uh, by what Bill O'Reilly was saying that the two biggest concerns in America are, how many know what the two biggest concerns of America are, the people? Is, is economy and what? Safety of Al-Qaeda, right? But he was saying how our president is focusing on uh, global warming and gun control. And how you know when things are crazy, you don't want more gun control. I mean, you want, I mean, bad guys, but I mean, you don't want good people not to be able to get guns, right? So he's just saying how it's out of touch. But I thought it was amazing that Geraldo said that his fifth grader, I thought it was wild he has a fifth grader, but he has a fifth grader, and he says, my fifth grader's biggest concern is climate change. Now, how many know the reason why that, and Bill O'Reilly goes, the reason why she has that is because of indoctrination. How many know what do you think is more important? What do you think is bigger fear? Getting blown up or the, the planet getting a little hotter? I think blown up, but, you know. So anyways, Babylon, my point I'm trying to make, is trying to sell us an agenda. Is trying to steer us away from the things that are really important and the things we should look at and trying to push. We're going to see that today. But real quick, I want to tell you a story. There were three sons who left home, and they went out on their own and prospered very well. And they discussed the gifts they were going to give their beloved aged mother. And the first said, I will build her a big house. I'm going to build my mother a big house. And so he did. And the second said, I'm going to send my beloved mother a Mercedes with her very own driver. And the third said, you remember how our mother enjoys reading the Bible so much? Now she can't see very well, so I decided to send her this remarkable parrot that recites the entire Bible. It's It took the elders in our church 12 years to train him and teach him this. Mom just has to name the chapter and verse, and the parrot recites it. Soon after, the mother sent out all the thank yous to her sons. First son, she said, Milton, she said, the house you built is huge. I live only in one room, and I have to clean the whole house. Second son, she says, Gerald, she said, I'm too old to travel, and I stay home most of the time, so I rarely use the Mercedes, and that driver you sent is very rude. But to the last son, she says, but Donald, I loved your gift. That little chicken you sent was delicious. (laughs) That's kind of funny. (laughs) Anyway. I don't usually tell jokes, but I figure, you know, I heard, I heard a pastor once say about me in the old days, and Beverly said this about me, but uh, is, uh, you know, I kind of preach sometimes a hard message, and uh, I, you remember, does anyone remember Mary Poppins? I mean, remember she said a, fo- a spoonful of sugar makes the medicine go down? And so I think sometimes we need a little humor when we hear some hard things, and so hopefully that's why you understand. I, sometimes people tease about pastors telling jokes, but I think sometimes... Uh, When you're serious, you should also have some jokes. Well, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this day, and thank you for your goodness. I pray that as we study your word, as we study the book of Daniel, that you would just speak to us, Lord, that you would change us, Lord, as we're going to see today that Daniel, again, purposed in his heart to not be defiled by this world, to not be defiled by the things of Babylon. And so, God, I pray that you'll teach us how to purpose in our hearts not to be defiled, how to purpose in our hearts to honor you, to make decisions before we're in 
the hard situation, that we've already decided how we're going to respond. We've already decided how we're going to react. And Lord, give us a, excuse me, a boldness. Give us a boldness, Lord, to speak the truth in love today. As we see, there's so many agendas being pushed towards us. I ask that, Lord, as the church of Jesus Christ would arise in love, that it would speak the truth in love to a lost and dying world, to a world that, that is saying climate change is the most important thing. When what about starving people? What about Al-Qaeda? What about people trying to kill people in the name of religion? I pray, Lord, you'll help us to be people that can be relevant in this society. Thank you that you are. But Lord, we as your church need to stand up and speak. So help us to purpose to not be defiled. Purpose to not be sh shut down or silenced. Purpose to honor you. Lord, you said in your word, as we will see today, that you honor those who honor you. But you said you despise or you treat lightly those who do not honor you. And I pray, God, that we would want to honor you so that we would have your favor and your blessing. We don't obey to get, but Lord, when we do, there is blessing, there is favor. And I know that everyone here wants your favor on their lives, on their marriages, on their children, on their work. And so God, I ask that you'll return starting with this church and others like it, that we would really purpose in our hearts to honor you, to not be defiled by this world. We ask this, Lord, in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone agreed, said? Amen. 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 Verse 5 of Daniel chapter 1. And the king appointed for them, this is King Nebuchadnezzar, daily provisions of the king's delicacies and the wine which he drank and Three years of training for them, this is for Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, so that the end of the time they might serve before the king. Verse 6, now from among those of the sons of Judah were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. Verse 7, to them the chief of the eunuchs gave names. He gave Daniel the name Belteshazzar, Belteshazzar, can't say that. To Hananiah he gave Shadrach, to Mishael he gave Meshach. And Ezariah Abednego. But Daniel, verse 8, purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's delicacies, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the chief of the eunuchs that he might not defile himself. When Daniel was offered the king's food, and now I have to believe that the king's food was good food, right? When he was offered the king's food and wine, Daniel didn't want to defile himself because this meat a lot of times was sacrificed to pagan gods or idols. So he didn't want to do that. And also he didn't want to drink the wine because he was going to be a judge. He was going to be someone who would be in the, you know, kind of a, a ruler in the kingdom and he didn't want his, just, his judgment to be perverted. Proverbs 31.4 says this. This is a good verse for all of us. You know, the Bible doesn't say we cannot drink, amen? But the Bible says that we shouldn't get drunk, amen? And the Bible says an elder should not be given too much wine or to strong drink, shouldn't be given too much. We ask the elders, only the elders, not even deacons. If you want to drink, be a deacon here. But if, if you're an elder here, we ask the elders to, even though people say, well, where's that in the Bible? We ask the elders to lay down their right to drink. Because how many know that one of the greatest opiates or greatest stumbling blocks of America has been alcohol? More than drugs, more than anything. A lot of you have been affected by it. Your parents, your grandparents, your mom, your dad. My, both my, my mom, my dad. My mom died of alcoholism. My dad was a raging alcoholic. And we ask to lay down that right because how many know what, what I do in moderation, people do in excess. I'll never forget a guy, I think I've told this story, but I'll say it again. A guy who just came out, and it was from a Calvary here in town. He just came out of rehab for drinking, and he watched an elder at a restaurant, and he wasn't supposed to drink, but he drank. He saw him drinking wine. So he said to his wife, well, if he can drink, why can't I drink? So this guy, one day out of rehab, or alcoholic you know, rehab, 
he started drinking, and he that night ran through a, 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 a train crossing, almost got hit by a train, got a DWI right back where he sat. How many know I, I wouldn't want to be the elder that kind of helped encourage that? And so we asked people to lay down that right. Amen? It's a, you know, all things are profitable, as we'll see, but not all things are lawful. But here's what it says. Proverbs 31.4. It's not for kings, Olumu, to guzzle wine. Rulers should not crave alcohol. Verse 5. For if they drink, they may forget the law and not give justice to the oppressed. Now, I don't ever know, I don't know if you guys ever drank in high school or college or drank, but how many know when you drink, you do things that you would never do sober? And what do people say? Oh, I, what did I do? I don't know what I did. You know, if we're a Christian, how many know we should never get to that place? And you know, I've laid down alcohol because here's why. I didn't like, I, I'm one of those people, I'm extremist. And when I drink, even tea, lemonade, anything, I drink a lot. And so I didn't like when I drink a couple beers as a Christian and all of a sudden going, I, just, I, I, don't, I don't think it's affected me. You know? How many people have you seen like that way? We went to, it was so funny, we were at a Christmas party and we saw a bunch of people in Canada, it was a little kid, and he says, Daddy, why is that lady talking funny? And she was from the church, you know, yeah, I love all you guys, you know. Isn't it weird how everyone loves everybody, right? You know, I normally hate you, but I love you, right? And uh, I just think it's best to stay away from that. Amen? Amen. Because you don't just forget the law for being a leader, but you forget you do things that you would never do. You do things like maybe cheat on your spouse. You, you light, you would be interested. You let down your guard when you're drinking. So it's very important for us to stay away from that as, God, as wanting to be godly men and women. I'm pretty sure that God would have uh, not faulted Daniel for partaking of the meat and even the wine. But as Paul said concerning meat, he said this and other issues. In 1 Corinthians 6, 12, he says, All things are lawful for me. So in Christ, we have liberty, amen? All things are lawful for me, but hear this, but all things are not helpful or, other versions say, beneficial or profitable. How many know all things are lawful to you, but not all things are beneficial, amen? Not all things are beneficial. In other words, all things you and I, even though we have freedom, it is not wise, amen? I can, get, I can drink, but if I get drunk, and I drive, and I blow through a stop sign. How many know it's not going to be a wise day if I kill someone? It's going to change my life drastically in other people's lives, and that's going to probably ruin my ministry and my life. Because why? Even though I had liberty to drink, that was not a wise choice. Amen? And so we have to realize, even though you know, we say, what do Christians say? Grace, grace, grace! We have to realize that just because we have the grace to do things doesn't mean it's always profitable or helpful or beneficial you know I used to wrestle and uh, I know it's hard to believe but I was a pretty I used to wrestle and the rule book I'm pretty sure states that you can wear pretty much anything you want you know what I mean maybe not high heels but I think you have to wear wrestling shoes but you know I used to wear tights and uh and I wore the little monkey man, you know, the little caveman suit or whatever, the little straps. And I, I mean, and I'm pretty sure, I don't know, I didn't check it out, but I'm pretty sure that if I wanted to wear a wetsuit wrestling, I could have wore a wetsuit wrestling. But how many know if I went to the wrestling mat or ring with a wetsuit, there could have, you know, I could have done it, but it would have, it would have been lawful for me, but it would have been very dumb and foolish because it would have hindered my ability to do my job well as a wrestler. I was, you know, it would hinder what I wanted to do. So Paul says, although all things are lawful, some things that we can do slow us down. Some things entangle us. Some things tie us up. And he went on to say, hear this, same verse in Corinthians. He says, all things are lawful for me, but I will not be brought under the power of any. Do you hear that? I have freedom, but I have to make sure. How many know this? Sin enslaves. I always told kids this. I, know, you know, I don't think Ted Bundy said, I'm going to look at pornography, and one day I'm going to be a, a terrible serial killer. 
I don't think people say, hey, I'm going to start drinking in high school and I'm going to become a raging alcoholic and destroy my family. I don't think people say, hey, I'm going to do drugs, recreational drugs in college, and I'm going to become a, a street person because I'm addicted to crystal meth. How many know sin enslaves? It takes you farther than you want to go. I was singing, I think I was singing to Jeff, you know, the Boss Gag song. I don't know if you know that. You better bring the check around. How many know that sin, when the check comes, you know, sin's pleasurable for a season, the Bible says. But how many know when the check comes around, it's not worth it? Sin is expensive. Sin is expensive physically. Sin is expensive money-wise. And, you know, we need to know that. And we need to stay and realize that it's not always the wisest thing we can do. He went on to say, as I said, all things are lawful, but I will not be brought in the power of any. Paul loved, hear this, his freedom in Christ too much to be enslaved again to sin. I'll tell you this, guys. Jesus Christ, when you receive Christ, he freed you from the power of sin and death. It says the spirit of life in Christ has set you free from the spirit of sin and death. But how many know you have a choice as a Christian? As a non-Christian, all you can do is what? Sin until you receive Jesus. But as a Christian, you have a choice to what? Walk in the old nature or walk in the spirit. But how many know Paul says, guys, trust me, it's a lot better to walk in the spirit than it is to walk in the old nature. Hear this. I I heard a, a pastor say this, and I really, you know, people say, you know, all the time, you hear people say, we're under the judgment of God. Right, you'll hear that a lot. But it's funny because I hear that and I go, wait a second, but we're under grace. We're under this is the time of grace in the church. Here's what this pastor said. This is Ravi Zacharias, so you know it's right. He said, He said, We are under the time of grace, unmerited, undeserved favor. But and God gives us free will to walk in the flesh or walk in the spirit. But he says, Hear this, you have free will, you have choice. And God gives you that because he loves you and he's gracious. But hear this. You do not have the right, like the homosexual or the liberal, you do not have the right to change the consequence of your choice. Does that make sense? You sow to the flesh, you will reap, what does the Bible say? Corruption, death. Do you see my point? If you say, I feel like I'm under judgment, it's because why? You're walking in the flesh. Does that make sense? It's not that God's going, it's more of sowing and reaping. And hear this, if you're a Christian, here's the good news. Here's what we did, good news. All we have to do is what? Repent. All we have to do is turn back and say like, Paul, I don't want to be, why am I going back? You know, like the Bible says, like a pig returns to the slop. I don't, why am I going back to the mud? We need to just repent and turn back. Amen? How many know the church needs to do that? The church needs to be like the prodigal son, say, I'm tired of the pig pen. I'm going back to my father. I'm going back to God. And that's what I pray for all of you. How many, how many want to go, really go back to God? Amen? Raise your hand. Yeah. You know? And we need to do that. So now, where did Daniel get this high standards to where he could stand as a young boy to a powerful, one of the most powerful kings of the known world. And now he's saying, hey, I, won't, I don't want to eat your food. I want to maintain the diet of a Jew. First, I believe, he came, it came from his parents. You see, Daniel's name literally means God is judge. Hananiah's name means the Lord is gracious. Michelle's name means none is like God. Ezariah's name means the Lord is my help. These were all godly names given to them, I believe, by godly parents. When Daniel was born, a revival was taking place in the land of Judah. And it was led by, if you remember, we talked about this in in, in Jeremiah, it was led by King Josiah, where he was remodeling the temple. The temple was in disarray. He's remodeling it. And when during the remodeling process, how many know this is pretty rough? But during the remodeling process, the sole surviving copy of the law was found. How many know that's pretty bad when there's no Bible and you're, you're, you're at a temple? Can you imagine? But how many know there's a lot of churches like that today that don't break open their Bibles? I was a missionary at a church in town. If I said the name, you'd probably, some of you would know it. Some of you have been there. And, but that church said to me, remember? Some of you have been there. And that church said to me, the pastor said, if you bring a Bible to our church, you probably will not last. How many know that's pretty weird? You bring a Bible to church, you probably won't last. Because why? They didn't open the Word of God. 
How can we be like God if we don't read his manual on how to please him? Amen? But yet, most sermons today, sadly, are how to, how to be a good husband, how to be a better parent. It's basically, I love what Pastor Chuck Smith said before he died. He said, most pastors today are like Tony Robbins with a little Jesus sprinkled on top of it. You know, the motivational speaker. That's all it is. It's just kind of motivation. And how we know, there's nothing wrong with motivation, but we need to have the word of God too. Amen. Amen. And so this revival broke out because, broke out because they, they read the copy of the law. And so when they read the word of God, revival broke out because the spirit of God touched them. No doubt Daniel's parents were probably influenced by this revival. And so were the parents of his friends. Hear this. Solomon says this in Proverbs 22.6, and this is a, a good verse. You know, I want to say this. A lot of you have come to know Christ older in life. So a lot of your kids did not, were not raised in Christ. And so how many know it's frustrating? But, you know, because your kids have sort of not walking with God. Here you found God, now they're kind of doing their own thing, and you feel guilty because you kind of helped them kind of live for themselves. But hear this verse. For those of you who are young parents right now, hear this verse and hold on to it. Proverbs 22, 6. It says, train up your child in the way they should go, and when they are old, they will not depart from it. I couldn't find it, but that word train there is like, I heard one commentary, I couldn't find it, so you know maybe I'm just making it up, but it's like training a horse. It's like, how do you know with a horse? You love, you have horses, you know how great they are, but if a horse bucks you off and a horse just runs away, how do you know what do you have to do with that horse? You have to break that horse. How do you know sometimes in training your child, there's some things you have to break out of your, your child, your little precious one. How do you know the Bible says, this is really PC, isn't it? Spare the rod, spoil the child. Amen? It says in Proverbs, iniquity or sin is bound up in the heart of the child, but the rod of discipline, what? Drives it out. Why does a horse stop bucking? Because it's been disciplined that if you keep doing this, there's going to be some consequences, right? And then it realizes it's not worth bucking, or as God said to Paul, it's hard to kick against the goads. It's hard to kick against the spikes. And so you know, the training, we need to, how many, how many know we need a little more discipline with our kids? I love, it was funny, I was watching like a 60-minute show, and they were saying, these psychologists, these experts were saying they didn't have kids. They were saying that you should never spank your child, never. Now hear this, let me preface, you don't spank your child in anger, and there's a difference between spanking and beating, Amen. But they said, no spanking, nothing, no hit, no spanking, not on the fanny, not controlled, nothing. You don't do it. Just give them time out, take things away. And then it said, these, then it showed them a couple years later, these, these experts had kids. And guess what they said? Sometimes there has to be a spanking. Right? Because the time out, you know, you can put me in a time out all day. I just goof around at the time out. You know, I mean, I'd have fun. You know, I'd shoot spit wads at the time. I mean, it's like whatever, you know. But, anyways. But you touch my little buttum, and oh my goodness. But uh, that's a promise to parents. Train your kids in the word of God, in the ways of God, and they will continue, the Bible promises, to walk with God. Oh, now hear this. They might detour. They might stumble a while, just like you do at times. But God's promise is that if you train them up, you speak the truth to them, you, and hear this, this is another thing I'll say, I'll just add this as in the text, but hear this, I've told you, one of my keys to parenting, here's the key I've learned, is humble yourself. When you blow it, dad, when you're driving on the road and some little word, beep, comes out, don't go, well, he deserved it. Humble yourself and say, you know what, honey, that was wrong. Son, that was wrong. Because how many know, you know, kids are mirrors of us. Have you ever seen, have you ever looked at your kid and go, i never forget my grandma. I have to say this, this is great. My grandma, my dad would just say this to my wife and kids. My grandma, you know, I, I tend to have a temper in the flesh. I know it's hard to believe, but I do. And, and my grandma, so I get angry sometimes, and my grandma go, oh, where does he get this anger? Well, my grandma has a temper on steroids. How many know, you know, a lot of times, have you ever looked, have you ever seriously honest, be real with me, how many of you looked at your kids and go, 
oh my goodness, my kid is like me. How many of you? You hear him do it? I mean, I was watching Mariah the other day, and someone made Mariah mad, and Mariah's just like, no, you didn't. I mean, she didn't say it like that, but she was just like, talk to the hand. And I'm going, that reminds me of me. Because she was just like, mm, you know what I mean? You did me wrong, and you ain't repenting, and so I'm, mm, mm, and I'm like, oh, my goodness. And so I had to say to her, do as I say, not as I do. No, I didn't say that. I didn't say that. But anyway. But God's promise is you train up your kids, they will walk with him as time goes on, they'll come back. In addition to parents training at the home, Daniel, hear this, had purposed in his heart that he decided that he wouldn't defile himself or let, or, or defile herself. And here's the question I want to ask you and I today. Are you letting yourself be defiled in some area today? Are you letting the devil have a foothold in your life? Because hear this, guys. I, I, I forget who it was, but one great man of God said, it's very hard to live a faith-filled life. It's very hard to live, pray the prayer of faith when the devil has something on you. How many know it's important to not give the devil place by willful sin? Do you know what I mean? The difference? There's a difference between slipping and there's a difference between walking in continual defilement. Because when we do that, what happens? When, you, when someone says, hey, pray for me, you kind of go, ugh, because all of a sudden the devil's like, you're going to pray for them? You? How many want to be free from that? I love what Jesus said. He says, Satan has tried me. Jesus said this, but he has nothing in me. Wouldn't you like to be able to say that? Oh, I'm not perfect, but when I blow it, I quickly repent and I move on. And I don't stay continually getting stuck in this old way of life and getting defiled. So you need to ask yourself, is there an area where I'm opening the door? I love what A.W. Tozer said. He says, the man or woman of God needs to be going down a tunnel towards God and this bright light towards God and blocking up all the exits from God. How many know there's a lot of things screaming for you to exit? You know, young men, computer, pornography, right? Games, video games, movies, a lot of things. You know, business, your idol, your work, Hobbies, golf, all these things, screaming, anything but God. But how many know the man or woman of God needs to what? Block off those things that pull us away from God. Amen? Amen? And hear this, true victory for you and I begins when we purpose in our hearts to make a decision to say no more. I tell you, you know, people do steroids, right, to get big... (laughs) Right? I was looking at this drug that, like, uh, Thor. You ever see the guy Thor? Whatever. What's his name? Thor. Whatever, Thor. But he just said, he goes, he just said, I did rubber bands and I did no weights. Whatever. Have you seen Thor? Give me a break. He probably, so then I find out, I was reading this thing, of, I don't know what thing, but he takes this, like, supplement that shreds you and this testosterone stuff and he's doing all this stuff. How do you know? You know what I mean? You don't just do a couple rubber bands and look like Thor. Okay? <laughs> so, <laughs> I don't even remember what I was trying to say by that thing. But is, uh, what was I saying? No, I can't. But, oh, this is what I was saying. Just like we want to take, we like to, sometimes those of us who try to get big, you were tempted to take, I, I didn't do steroids, as you could tell. But, uh, <laughs> You like to cheat a little. Well, how many know, we, we want to, I, w- I think you could make billions if you had a drug that could make you do what you want to do. Just gave you willpower, you know? I want to quit smoking. Take a drug, all of a sudden your desire becomes a reality. But how many know, there's no drug like that. They say hypnosis, but I mean, that doesn't, it kind of sort of not really works. But hear this, you have to get sick and tired of being sick and tired. I told you my thing, and I mean, I've kind of cheated. It's Christmas, so you have to cheat, but, but uh, when I decided to lose some weight, it was because I told you. I, 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 does anyone remember uh, Dukes of Hazard? Do you remember, remember Boss Hog with the white suit? When I saw myself, I, I was shaking hands with Ted Cruz, and I was like, how you doing? And I had this suit on. I thought I was Boss Hog, which is not the white suit, and I went, no more. 
Maybe I need to take another picture of myself. <laughs> but do you know my point? You have to say, enough. No more. And Daniel did that. And we're going to see next week how God honored his commitment to not defile himself. How many know we want God's blessing, but we don't want to do the commitment? We don't want to say, I will stand up and speak the truth. I will risk. How many know, how many know the king could have said, oh, you don't want to eat my food? You don't want to drink my wine? Dead. He would tear people limb from limbs. He would destroy their house and make it a heap of rubber and kill their whole family. But he said, no, I'm going to trust God. And because what? He honored God. God what? Honored him. You're going to see great favor upon these men. Because, these young boys, I should say. Because they honored God. I'm reminded of Shammah. You all know Shammah from the Bible? Shammah? No. But Shammah was one of David's right-hand men. He was one of his mighty men, his former men. In his 2 Samuel 23, 11, we read that the Philistines were attacking and Shammah was given the job of guarding, hear this, big job, guarding the lentil fields. Beans. Beans. Now, come on, you could blow off guarding beans, right? You know, whatever, beans, right? I mean, he was guarding the beans. But the Philistines came, and everyone else split and ran for their lives, but not Shema. He said, I'm not going anywhere. I'll stay on my post. I'm going to do my job. Because I have purpose in my heart to be faithful to God and to be faithful to my earthly king. Shammah had purposed, as I said, in his heart. And the Spirit of God, because of that commitment of purpose, came upon him. And hear this. This is the neat thing. Because of the commitment, the Spirit of God came upon him. And he wiped out the entire Philistine army single-handedly. I mean, like that. It's kind of like God really wants you to be committed to him. It's kind of like, until you purpose to commit to me, I don't fully purpose to commit to you. Amen? Think about how many verses say that. I always quote the verse God gives me is uh, Jeremiah 29, 13. When you seek me, you will find me. Now here's the clause. When you search for me with all your heart. There's no half-heartedness. There's no, well, I kind of want to be in the world and I want you to. Go. What does it say in James? A double-minded man or woman is unstable in all his ways. God wants you all the way in. And what does Jesus say? Or go all the way out. Because at least if you're cold, you'll know you need to come back. But if you're kind of lukewarm, you'll be in this kind of mamsy-pamsy, worthless Christianity. How many know that's the church today? How many know I heard this, and I don't know if this is going to make sense to you, but I'm not advocating Donald Trump as the next president. He might be, but I'm not advocating it because I think he's got some issues. But hear this. I love what one pastor said. He says, you know why Donald Trump is so popular? Because he's saying the things a lot of us want to say, but we're too afraid to. And we see him say it, and then we go, you could say, yeah. You know? I, I mean, how many of can, can I just say this, please? I know you don't like me when I do this, but I just have to cause trouble. Did you hear about the thing in Philadelphia where the guy goes and shoots the police officer? And it shot him like 13 times. And the guy gets out of his car and chased after him, shot him. That's a police officer. I'd like him watching the front of our church. My goodness. You know? <laughs> Just a flesh wound. <laughs> I mean, wow. But guess what the mayor said immediately? Did you hear what the mayor said? Hey! Even though he said he did this for Al-Qaeda and ISIS and he's trying to do Sharia law and cops are enforcing laws against Sharia law, this has nothing to do with the Muslim faith. <sighs> Am I the... Uh, hello? <laughs> hello? If one Christian, one Christian even sort of says he goes to a church maybe once when he's three and he blows up an abortion clinic, all Christians are nuts. Right? But a guy can say, I did this for, Muslim, for Allah. I am, you know, praise Allah, Allah Akbar. And we go, I don't think it had anything to do with his religion. <laughs> Nothing. How many know we got to say enough? Two plus two equals four. Not three, always four. That doesn't mean now every Muslim is evil. But guess what? Do you see a ton of Christians doing this all around the world? Do you see a ton of Buddhists going, ooh, no. 
And yet we can't judge because that's terrible. How many know? Our P, do you think the devil laughs at our PCness? He goes, they're just boneheads. You know? Man, I, I just, and that's what I hope the church, I hope you, I say this, you go, why do you bring up politics? Because I hope you guys are getting frustrated. I'm not saying get militant. I'm not saying, that, but get frustrated to say there is truth. And we know truth, and we need to speak the truth and love the things and say, you know what? Hear, hear this. This is how crazy it was. 70 years ago, when, we, when, when the Japanese bombed Pearl Harbor, what did we do? 70, only 70 years ago. That's not that long ago. We said to the Japanese citizens, good citizens that loved us, you either go back to Japan or you're going to a camp in, in, in Catalina. Now, I'm not saying that, but how many know, when someone says, when you have 54% of Muslims that say we want to change the face of America, we want to bring America under Sharia law, how many know we should say no? How many know, do you know there's a law that was already done for that? Look it up, I'm terrible. There's, it's McCarran Act of 1952. McCarran Act, I forget the Latin, there's another part of it. McCarran Act, in 1952, is because communism were trying to infiltrate America, and they said, you know what, if you're coming here to subvert our government and to change the face of America, then we don't want you here. That's when we had a brain. How many know we need to have a brain again? And say, you know, we, don't, we believe in freedom of religion, but when your religion is trying to change the face of America by killing us, you don't have that freedom. Amen? Amen? Now hopefully some of you, do you, does everyone still love me? I mean, if you love it from Donald Trump with his weird hair, I mean, come on, I have weird hair, love me! Where was I? But he took the Philistine, so Shema took the Philistine iron single-handedly just because he was, and here this, he was just watching the bean field. Think of it as something really, really important. And how many know the Bible says that? He who is faithful with little will be faithful with much. Do not despise the day of small beginnings. How many of you, we all go, I'm doing a terrible job because it's just beans, but someday when I'm a pastor, I'll do really good. The Bible says, Jesus said, no, you won't. If you're not faithful with small things, you won't be faithful with big things. If you don't, you say, when I get a lot of money, then I'll tithe. If you don't tithe now, you won't tithe when you make lots of money. Now that's purpose of heart, what Shema did. Maybe you're wondering why, you know, you, maybe you're wondering, why am I always in the nursery changing diapers Sunday after Sunday? Now, hopefully you're not changing diapers Sunday after Sunday because Rachel should have you doing once a month, right, Rachel? <laughs> but if you feel that way, say, don't they know my talents? I am so far beyond diapers. <laughs> or maybe we've asked you to usher. We asked someone to usher the other day, like, oh, I, I, uh, I mean, I, uh, <laughs> Man, I don't know what it is about commitment, you know what I mean? It's like, I'm like, you know, it's not like every single week. It's just, you know, hey, ah, commitment, you know? But I think sometimes we go, you know, we don't want to be faithful with little, but how I many know God says he was faithful with little, be faithful with much? I love that when I started the ministry, Pastor John here in Tucson, I had already been a youth pastor, so I had already gone to Bible college, so I thought, I'm the man, da-da. He said, here's how you're going to play it. I'm going to put you on as, as uh, 20 hours of uh, being a youth pastor and 20 hours of being a janitor. I know that was a good thing for me. It humbled me. Nothing like cleaning a urinal for Jesus. Nothing, oh, oh God, I can tell you a story. I won't tell you a story. Well, I will tell you a story. One time, we had a guy, and this is when I went, this is not in the job description. But we had a guy who couldn't get off the toilet. I had to get him off the toilet. I went, I don't think, this isn't right. But I'll tell you, that's the stuff that will humble you. That's the stuff that will remind you you're not all that in a box of chocolates. You're, you're just a guy. And I'll tell you, how many, know, how many, how many old-timers like me can say, hey, amen, these young whippersnappers need some of that today, hey, amen? Need some work. But if the Lord has called you to do these things, maybe usher, greeter, diaper changer, then be faithful in it. Do it with all your heart. Purpose in your heart to do it for the Lord and for his glory. As the Lord did with Shema, he will do with you and I. He will honor you and meet you wherever you are, even in the small things. I think sometimes, I love what Billy Graham said. He said, you know, everyone thinks how great I am. 
He says, everyone thinks I've touched the world and I've preached to more people than Jesus. But he says, you know what I think? The guy who's sweeping the stage for free volunteering probably has more rewards in heaven than I do. And as soon as I think, you, you know, me up front, I mean, I get a lot of static as a pastor, but I also get some accolades. You know, I get some praise once in a while. You guys get weird and say, hey, good job. No, okay. But, you know, but I think the person who just says, I, I just do nursery because I just love kids and I just want these kids to know love of Jesus, I think they get every bit as re- much reward as I do, if not more. Because they're un- it's not seen. It's not, ha, ah, ha, you know, it's, it's not cheered. And I want to tell you that nothing you do for God in love will ever be un- will not be rewarded or, or, or uh, worth it. 1 Samuel 2.30 says this, For those who honor me, I will honor. And those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Isn't that kind of scary? Do you hear that? That's God talking. You honor me, I'll honor you. You despise me, then I will lightly esteem you. Take you lightly. Do you feel sometimes that God maybe takes you lightly? He doesn't really answer, but maybe it's because you have to say, is there areas I'm not honoring you, Lord? Let's read the whole thing, verse 28. If you want, I don't know if you're a quick turner. If not, just write her down. You can check it later. But verse 28 of 1 Samuel 2, it says this, and it's talking about Eli, the, the high priest. And he says this, this is what Samuel the prophet saying to him, or God through this prophet. He says, I chose you, or chose your ancestor, Aaron, from among the tribes of Israel to be my priest, to offer sacrifice on my altar to burn incense and to wear the priestly vest as he served me. And I assign the sacrificial offerings to you, priests. Verse 29. So why do you scorn my sacrifices and offerings? Now hear this real quick. His sons, Eli's sons, were priests. But what they would do is when people were sacrificing or boiling the meat, they would just take a big prong and and stick it in and take the best pieces of meat and just take the sacrifice before they were sacrificed to the Lord. They were like, hey, give me some meat. And they would just take the sacrifice. And they would say, if you don't give me the best, they say, well, let's, let us first cook off the fat. And he'd say, no, if you don't let us have it, we'll take it by force. I mean, that's pretty rough when a priest beats you. I've never taken your tithe by force. Amen? Could you imagine? Give me your tithe or else. You know? So he says, Verse 20, so, they, so do you scorn my sacrifice and offerings? Why do you give your sons, talking to Eli, his sons were doing this, more honor than you give me? And that's back to disciplining our kids. For you, for you and they have become fat from the best offerings of my people Israel. Verse 30, therefore the Lord, the, God, the Lord God of Israel says, I promise that your branch of the tribe of Levi would always be my priests. But again, here it is. I will honor those who honor me and I'll despise those who think lightly of me. Hear this. His two sons were killed. Eli heard about it. He fell over and broke his neck. How many know God was pretty much saying, done with that part of that lineage. We're gonna move on because I don't like the way you're acting. Does that ever scare you? You know? Does that ever concern you that, that God, you know, I mean, like I said, back to the grace thing, but how many know we're sowing to the flesh and wondering why things are so crazy? But we need to get back to the Lord and back to purposing in our hearts to say, God, I'm going to do it your way. I'm going to speak the truth in love, and I'm not going to be defiled by this world just like Daniel. And I'm going to stand for you. Hear God through the prophet Samuel saying, Eli, who was the high priest at the time, you and your family have heritage reaching all the way back to Aaron. In the days of Exodus, you were given the great privilege to walk with me, to stand before me. And isn't that amazing? God says you have a privilege of standing before him. But you despised it by allowing your sons to sin. You honored, hear this, parents, you honored your sons above me. You know, I think this happens today. You know, I think this happens today. Here's how it happens today. And this is free. Did you notice he said, you honored your sons above me. You know how people do that today? 1 Corinthians 5 says what? 
if someone's sexually immoral, adulterous, fornicator, uh, homosexual, drunkard, swindler, from such people don't even eat. How many know we're supposed to break fellowship, the Bible says, from people who are saying they're Christian and walking willfully in those ways? Not someone who was that way, but someone who's walking. But guess what people say? Oh, I could never do that to my child. Isn't that doing what Eli did? Isn't it? Because he's saying, I love my kids more than the word of God or what God says. And God has something to say here. Here's what he says. But you despise it by allowing your sons to sin. You honored your sons above me. You cared more about them liking you than about what I thought of the situation. Hear this, mom and dads. And I'm sorry I get serious. That's why I told the joke at the beginning. Okay? But here it is. Mom and dads or parents-to-be or grandparents, take note of this. If your primary goal is to be as a parent is to have your kids like you, then you will not be happy of the outcome of your kids. Amen? Amen? I'm reminded of the book. Do you remember this book? Great title. I never read it, but here's the title. I am not your friend. I'm your parent. You try to be your kid's best friend, guess what? It ain't going to be a good day. But guess what? You be a parent and then be a friend, it's a good day. Amen? Amen. It's getting a little quiet out there. (laughs) Don't like you. Your primary goal as a parent should be that your kids know, hear this, what is right in the sight of God. And your job as a parent is to lovingly exhort them, pray for them, and encourage them to live for God, especially if they're in your house. How many know I love what one pastor said, that we have to live by the golden rule. He who has the gold rules. If they're little legs, I don't care. I love what, this is from Dave, this is from your guy. This is from, uh, what's his name? Uh, what's the financial guy? Dave Ramsey says, I don't care if your son comes home at 26 years old. He says, his legs dangle in your table. You say to him, you know where we go every 10, 10 o'clock every Sunday? We go to church. And guess what? You're going with us. I hear parents, oh, but I can never pressure him. No. He's eating your food. He's taking your money. Why couldn't you lovingly pressure? Hey, this is what we do here. You're in the house again. Guess what? You're my boy again. Let's go. But we said, no, no. If that means discipline and consequences, so be it. And if they hate you for a little while in the process, so be it. But parents, we must honor God. And you hear this, guess guess what, guys? Kids usually tend to go to the most disciplined parent. I'll never forget this, to prove this to you. My, it might for a while, they might want to go with the loosey-goosey dad or mom, but hear this. My, gran, my, mom, my grandma didn't have, um, her mom died when she was six. So because of that, she spoiled my mom. Spoiled her to death. Everything was my mom. My mom could do no wrong. It was almost like Nellie Olson. I've been watching Little House on the Prairie. She just could do anything. But you know what happened? My mother ended up despising my grandmother because she realized you've crippled me by letting me do everything and anything and so that when I get out in the real world, I don't, people don't treat me the way you do. How many know there becomes a great resentment for that? I love what Dobson said once, either you can discipline your children in love or you, a police officer, will do it in not so love. Or a boss, you're fired. Trump, you're fired. But parent, we must honor God more than we honor our kids. Eli wanted to be cool in the eyes of his boys and it would lead to their death and downfall, downfall and death. And it would lead to him being so overwhelmed that the ark was taken that he fell back and broke his neck. How many know that's not the legacy I want? Amen? And it's because he knew, oh my goodness, I blew it. I blew it. So here it is. Smile now. Let's purpose in our hearts today to be like Daniel to be like Shamal, and to choose to not be defiled or to compromise any longer with Babylon or this world. Amen? Let's get sick and tired of being sick 
and tired. Let's get sick and tired of having a form of godliness, but denying the power thereof. Do you know what that verse means? It means that if you're in Christ and you're walking in the Spirit, your life should be different. But you know what's sad today? Most Christians are just excited about being saved rather than being saved and transformed. Amen? How many know this world is dying for life? Dying, literally, for truth. And until we step up and purpose in our heart to say, you know what, I'm going to speak the truth. I'm going to set my life apart. And if it costs me, so be it. But here's the promise you just heard in Samuel. God honors always those who honor him. And I believe it's time for the church of Jesus Christ to step up and say, you know what, God, I'm tired of trying to please the world. I'm trying to, trying to, I'm tired of trying to please my kids. I want to please you. How many know this? If your goal is to please one person, and that's God, then all the people who love God will be pleased with you. But like the old world is saying, you try to please everyone, you end up pleasing who? No one. Amen? And so I pray that we'll make life simple and just one purpose in our heart to please God and to live honorably for him. Amen. Let's pray. Father God, thank you so much. And I pray, Lord, that... uh, I pray that, Father, that there's a difference when I say things like this of condemnation and conviction. I pray that there would be no condemnation here, but there would be deep conviction. I pray that, Lord, we would all get sick and tired of being sick and tired. And we would say, you know, if we can like someone like Donald Trump, why can't we like you? And why can't we say, you know what, we want to speak your truth and not be ashamed of you and your word. So God, I pray right now for your church. I ask that right now you would give your church a Holy Ghost boldness. I didn't say an obnoxiousness. I didn't say a meanness. I didn't say a militantness. But I pray for a Holy Ghost boldness that will speak up, that will say, you know, I'm not going to be defiled anymore. I'm not going to let climate change be the greatest thing I worry about. I'm going to care about morality. I'm going to care about truth. I'm going to care about calling wrong right and right wrong. I want to see it turned around to where wrong is wrong and right is right. So God, give us your people. Let us pray. Let us be men and women who purpose in our hearts not to be defiled, who purpose in our hearts to honor you, that say, Lord, we'll honor you, even if it costs us our children at times, even if it costs us our spouse at times, even if it costs us our job. We're going to honor you, Lord, because you promise that you honor those who honor you. And those who don't honor you, those who take you lightly, you will lightly esteem them. And Lord, in this day and age, we do not need to be lightly esteemed by you. Amen? So God, I ask that you would give us that heart to want to esteem you like you've esteemed us by dying on the cross for our sins. Let us give our life to you as you have lovingly given your life to us. Not to earn our salvation. Not to earn favor. But because we are favored, Lord. Let us do it Because it's right. Because we're tired of the double talk. We're tired of right being wrong and wrong being right. And we're tired of saying, oh, you know, everything, you know, whatever. We're tired of just double talk. Let us be men and women who make our yes, yes, and our no, no. Bring integrity back into our marriages, back into our families and back into our church, and ultimately back into our country. Amen? Amen. And so, Lord, I ask this, and we believe for this. And everyone agreed with this prayer? Says, amen. 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 Love you guys. Stand and may worship.